Hello, everyone, and we welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable discussion. Today is Sunday, May 12, 2019. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church, Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And we're so happy to welcome you all here this morning. We'll start with our morning prayer. From Pulpit and Press, page 10, it's a section from Mrs. Eddy's dedicatory sermon. Divine Presence, breathe thou thy blessing on every heart in this house. Speak out, O soul. This is the newborn of spirit. This is his redeemed. This is beloved. May the kingdom of God within you with you always, reascending, bear you outward, upward, heavenward. Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you. And from miscellaneous writings, we today in this classroom are enough to convert the world if we are of one mind. For then the whole world will feel the influence of this mind as when the earth was without form, and mind spake, and form appeared. Our subject today is Adam and Fallen Man, and we will start with our watching point. Watch number 279. Watch lest you claim immunity from error, while you still retain a sense of its reality in another. Casting a sense of sin upon another exposes the sin within yourself. Mrs. Eddy once said, quote, You will be condemned until you refuse to see condemnation. End quote. Also on page 131 of miscellaneous, miscellaneous writing, we read, quote, Whoever challenges the errors of others and cherishes his own can neither help himself nor others, end quote. Any comments on that? Bought it? Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't heard that one. Bought it, you got it. <laughs> Good one. Judge, that you, judge, not that be, judge not that you be not judged. Yes. I have a question. Um, what does it mean uh, to cherish your own errors? What do they mean by what does she mean by that? Cherish your own errors. Yeah. The whole time, so I'm not want to get rid of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The fact that they are errors. Yeah. It's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. No. You you like your selfishness. You like. You know, you have a reason to resent someone or to condemn someone because they did you wrong, and you chew that, and you so you're cherishing it. I see. That's very helpful. Good. You you need to drop it like a hot potato. And if you think of yourself as a creator and having children that you own that are beholden to you, you're cherishing an error. Human ways and means of this life are not the divine science ways. They might they might be humanly good and seem to be humanly good, but divinely they're not. And that false sense, and we, we are going to talk about it today, since today would seem to be called Mother's Day. <laughs> we, we, we will get into that. We have to as scientists. This reminds me of the of the second daily duty, neither animosity nor a personal attachment. Very much. That's right. And that is why we say it every day and work to live it every day. And what is personal attachment? This is my child instead of God's child. Thank you. This is my child, or my husband, or my nephew, or my whoever, instead of saying it is God's child. 
because then you feel it owes, it has personal responsibilities, owes you something. And that's how most of the world thinks. And that does not mean that we are not kind and loving to our human parents. Children. Children. But we don't see them personally and make personal demands on them. Or prefer them over any of other any other of God's children. Yes. We'll get into this, too, because that, that is an, a clear indication. Now, today we're going to talk about, because the lesson is Adam and fallen man, and how to stay out of that bad dream. And you see, oh, I forgot to bring something. Oh, well. You see, Eris starts out speaking very nicely. Like, yes, you're a mommy, and you created this cute little thing, and life is so wonderful. And and then it grows, and it grows, and this is the human sense of things. And Mrs. Eddy says, if you have that human sense of things as a Christian scientist, what? One in the blue book, she said it was a great sin. You're living a lie. Uh, yes. Lawrence? I said, she said that to love, you know, to see anyone materially is not really loving them. Oh. Yes. Yes, it isn't loving them. It's very human, and, and you, you, you want them for your own means and purposes, perhaps and not to let them be a child of God and find out what is right for them instead of what is right for you. What I forgot to bring was I'd seen, it was a YouTube thing, it was how, how Hitler tricked so many people. And it was a short YouTube, but one of the things, I wrote down the list because it was the working of animal magnetism. And the first thing it said, and it, it showed it, when he spoke, he, he spoke to huge crowds of people. It was, it was called mass mesmerism. But he would start out, they said, in a very sonor- sonorous, <laughs> S-O-N-O-R, sonorous, 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 thank you, sonorous tone. You know, kind of soft and deep and low. And that's, that's the mesmeric, you know, put you to sleep. Home. And then he would get more intense. And then finally he was shouting. And everybody was, oh, so, whoa, this is wonderful. If you could have seen the faces of, of the people listening. Now, what they didn't address, you know, was this attack on the Jews that he could say all this stuff that was just so totally wrong. And yet people bought into it. They also, it started out that they were vulnerable because it was right after World War I, and they were feeling bad and sorry for themselves. They had lost the war, and he promised them so much. But you see, when Era talks to you, it was a perfect description. Oh, that's a beautiful girl over there. (laughs) She looks really nice to me. Now I can't get her out of my singing. <laughs> I've got to have her. I've got to have her. The intensity grows. And then finally it's shouting in your ear. You can't get it to stop. This is the progression of sin. If you let it. So stop it when it's this, oh. That's the mesmeric part of it. And then, of course, while he was doing this, he was promising, oh, you'll be so happy with this woman. She's so much better than your wife. Look how beautiful she is. It promises you all these wonderful things. And you're spellbound. And in the case of Hitler, it said he went forward. He started recapturing all the countries that had been taken from Germany. And First World War One, and he did it without lifting a gun. 
He just went in and conquered them. And nobody stopped him. So there you see, there you're getting away with it. Wow, look, woo, look what I'm getting away with. It's not so hard. This is great. <laughs> this is wonderful. Boy, I'm meeting this girl in secret and no one knows. We're having a great old time. Nobody knows about it. Cool. Then suddenly people do know about it. <laughs> And then things aren't, don't look so good. And according to this YouTube, Hitler actually wanted to stop. He didn't want this thing to get so out of hand, according to this YouTube, the people that he talked to personally. He didn't want to escalate the war the way it was. He knew he really didn't know what the heck he was doing. But at that time, by that time, everyone else was getting pretty mad at him, including Churchill. And so things had escalated, and then he couldn't stop. Does all this sound familiar? This is the workings of evil. This is the workings of Adam and fallen man. This is what happened with the serpent in the garden. This is how it talks and convinces you that it's right, and you'll be fine if you follow it. Again, Mr. Sadie says, if error is ignored, it grows worse. So. It, absolutely. I use that one case of it enticing a person, but there are many, many other forms of it. There are many going on today, aren't there? And then, and then once you get into that, then, then comes, and it was interesting because I thought in the forum, and it, even in this watching point, the guilt, the blame, the condemnation, the Adam dream. Welcome to the Adam dream. So, is there a way of escape? Wake up. <laughs> well, that's it. Wake up. Don't listen to that voice when it starts out. You know that it's similar to the article Death Overcome by Big Nell Young in our book Collected Writings. When he was at the bottom of a lake. And that voice started, and at first it started, you know, kind of, whoa, oh, the reasonable, the mesmeric, and then it got more intense, and it was accusing him. It's the great accuser. and Oh, you lived a bad life. You did some bad things. <laughs> you deserve to die. And he said it was shouting in his ear, and he said the only way he escaped out of that was how. Thank you. He shouted louder than the voice that was shouting at him. Yeah. And he said if he didn't know that metaphysical point, he probably would have stayed at the bottom. But he knew what was going on. And so he shouted back, shouted louder, and overcame the voice, which was a very, there's a reason they call it aggressive very aggressive in belief. And this is why no one can be a nice little meek little pansy. And he said that. You've got to have this toughness in you and an understanding of the workings of animal magnetism. Any questions? So, How did Jesus deal with the devil when he was tempted in the wilderness? The devil said, well, you know, look at this. Look at all these things. I'll give them to you if you'll worship me. Trying to entice him. With all the world has to offer. Not just a little bit, but all the world. Just worship me. It, it, he usually sounds very reasonable in the beginning. There's something, and there's something in you that responds to it, that agrees to it. Whether you're looking for some other woman, or whether you want the power of the world, or there's something in you. I, I think sometimes for me, what happens is all of a sudden I realize that 
<laughs> I'm like mid conversation inside rehashing something that happened in the past. And it, and it, I'm like, I, I'm so happy about Christian Science because I realize it's not me. I don't want this out. And that that seems to be the only thing these days that comes up like that that's really loud. Like that. Thank you. Well, and you see, as you grow in science, the suggestions become very blatant to you. They're, they don't fool you. When you're new to it, you've been under all those suggestions. So you... You don't, you don't trust your own spiritual sense for a while. Well, and you're so used to listening to those suggestions, you don't realize that they're false suggestions. You just think it's you, and it's okay. Sometimes it helps to see down the path. If I follow this, where is it leading me? Which is, you know, goes to Suzanne's forum, which was very good. I don't know if she hears it then. Yes, I'm here. Okay, you yeah. want to speak to that, Suzanne? Yeah, I mean, I I think, um, you know, error always comes custom-made for each person, and it's always going to sound great. And, um, you know, I when I read Christian Science, I never, well, before coming to Plainfield, I, I think I glossed over so much because I just didn't want to face it and get out of the human mind, but I never knew about the human versus the divine mind before coming here, and now I can identify it when it just doesn't feel good to be in the human mind. It's like you can feel when you start to feel uneasy, like, wait a second, this doesn't sound, this doesn't sound right, and you can turn, turn it on a dime and go, no, I'm going to focus on God. Because the human mind is never going to focus on God. It's always going to focus on all this other stuff. And it all sounds so enticing, but it makes you feel, in the end, it, it's not a good end. So it, it's just, you. It, it was a great lesson, I have to say, just knowing what mind you're in and also clarifying what Jesus said to... Um, let that mind be in you, or where the Bible said not let that mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, I never knew what that truly meant all those years. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and you, know, you, you said the human mind thinking, uneasy, frustrating, negative, unloving, overly intellectual, lightheaded, dreamy. I'm sure you all can add more to that. Resentful, hateful, envious. And if you get into that, and as, as Zan said, a light bulb should go off, and you, whoa, no, I don't want to go here. Now, if you're cherishing it, you won't do it. You'll say, rah, 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 I got a reason to do this, and I can just sit here for an hour or two and be miserable and cry and be angry at somebody and be resentful or be envious, and who will know? I've hmm. got a good reason for doing it. Yep. Justify. Yep. Justifying, cherishing, and, and, who will you harm if you do that? No. So I like the the that gen, you know general rule that if it, it's not good, whether it's a feeling, what I see or what I hear, then it's not from God. And I think it's helped me to stop it right there. Thank you. I think the last thing compared to what what Floyd, that prayer that Florence gave this morning, where it was onward, upward, and heavenward. All of the Adam dream stuff is the opposite. Downward. Hellward. Hellward. <laughs> he says, downward, inward, downward, and hellward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So take your choice. <laughs> yeah, which one do you want? Who is going to speak? Was that Mike? Yes, uh, what I was going to say was that one thing I learned about cherishing somebody or something personally was that I had this fear of losing it. And uh, then when I had that fear of losing it, obviously the way of losing it was that it was going to die. And that was definitely malpractice. Thank you. That's a big bugaboo, is fear of losing it. Yeah. Thank you. 
And um, that's the personal sense again. You're seeing it. If something good is coming to you and it wears a face, well, where is the good truly coming from? God. Good is coming from God. Yes. And you see, this is what we fail to do a lot of times is knowing, all right, well, so-and-so was so helpful to me. I love them so much. But do then do you say, I'm totally dependent on them, and oh my gosh, what happens if they leave? <laughs> Whoops. Well, that's a problem. That's a problem. So what do you say to yourself? Since what the good he did comes from God, then it will be here still. Yes. Still here. It might take another form or face, but it's from God. And you, you'll end up seeing it everywhere, the good, if you have that attitude. Because God is all in all and everywhere. And you can be so thankful to God for sending you the good. And grateful to the person for, you know, being used by to do something good. But that's why we're here. That's why God created us. To express his love for us. Yes. And for others, and not to make it just within your own little clicky family, which was how I was raised. And, you know, it, it was all about my family. And I was dependent on them. And I was inclusive and exclusive. And I didn't know it. It was, it, And at that time, it was my highest sense of right. But Mrs. Evans blew the, you know, what out of that. And I didn't like it at first, but it was the greatest thing that could have happened to me because it, it made me insecure and fearful, just like just like Mike said. I was so afraid if I was going to lose. Now, practically, they're all gone. I mean, everybody's <laughs> gone. And, and yet... God is not. God is not. And we have a wonderful family here. <laughs> we do. We do. And if... To, to, to just depend on your human family for everything is unkind to them and, and to yourself. Are, and they aren't even gone because we have them in mind. We do. They because don't go anywhere, really. <laughs> no. Because whatever good you receive from them can never be lost, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been very grateful to learn that. God is the only attraction because then it helps me to realize that if I, if God is between me and other people, that's the only thing that can pull us together. You know, otherwise it's like trying to get two magnets to hold them together. You Thank know, you. as soon as you let go, they're just going to fly right apart. So, <laughs> which was right. pretty much every relationship I had before coming here <laughs> was like that. So. When you learn to put God in the middle of every all your relationships, and it's based on that, you will find each other when it's based on God. And that's why we have the friendships here, because it's based on God, and it brings us all together in, in a family. And I got a beautiful letter. It was last week. I have to answer it. It was from Texas. I didn't read it Wednesday. I'll read it this Wednesday. But, you know, she says she loves to join us because she feels a camaraderie, and she feels part of our family. I couldn't be happier to hear things like that. Because that's how we feel. Like you're all family. Even though some of you we've never met. But you're in our prayers because that's what churches do. We pray for each other. And we do have plenty of times together when you want to join in between all that we do, including the watches. So never feel alone. Oh, all this makes Mrs. Sebi, I mean, I'm just so grateful to her because when she emphasizes the first commandment, God's allness, it, it, it all ties in because she's saying that if God is all and God is love, then God is present everywhere, and that can be the only thing among us all, the world over, his love. Yes. It just makes sense. It makes sense. It unites, it connects us. And that is how we are able to have the high ideal that Mrs. Eddy says we have to have. Because
because unless you have that high ideal of who you are and who everyone really truly is, you're likely to accept the crap that says God isn't all, you know, that people do have limitations or that you can justify, you know, chewing on your error. <laughs> And when you know God is all, you're not going to say to yourself, my husband didn't do what I wanted him to do today, or I don't know where he is, or whatever. You'll know that right where he is is God. And the best thing you can do is know that they are governed by God. They have the mind of Christ, whether it's husband, son, wife, daughter, friend. Mother. Father. All of that, knowing they have the mind of Christ and God will tell them what to do. You don't have to rule them because God governs them. And when you try to rule them and then get upset if they don't do what you want them to do, you are hoofing up God's creation and you will suffer for it and feel bad and maybe even sick. I think uh, you have just given the perfect example, which is Mary Baker Eddy, her mother, was uh, very godly and left everything to God and told Mary Baker Eddy to go to God with things. And her father had this personal sense and uh, it had to be done his way. And that created a lot of issues there. But in the end, I mean, he still loved her. He still taught her honesty. He taught her righteousness, and he also taught her how to stick to God. Well, and she loved him for the good that he gave. And, and you see, that's what we always must do with everyone, just love them for the good, and then separate the, what's wrong from them. But love the good, bring the good out, emphasize the good, glorify the good, thank them for the good, but if you're always, like, complaining, or even if, if it's, as I just said, you, you're going to do it for two hours and you think nobody knows it, well, sorry, people feel your thoughts. You've got a strong thought, and especially as a scientist, Mrs. Evans used to teach us that. You can't go in your room and shut the door and think all these nasty things and, and think that no one feels it. And also, you're polluting your home, your body, everything. Do you want to do that? While you cherish your errors, feeling sorry for yourself. Now, in this kind of thinking, I can't say, oh, you poor dear. I mean, I can't. I can't say it to myself. <laughs> if I say it to myself, I'm cooked. <laughs> <laughs> Having a pity party is not ever good. No one will want to come either. <laughs> You'll be all by yourself. <laughs> they do. You don't want them there. <laughs> when the illusion of pain is screaming very loud, what do you do to scream louder and to overcome it? Well, I've given on page 130, Teaching and Addresses by Kimball, the little black book. There's a short treatment for pain there. Yep. And it says, it's a belief of life and matter, which is exactly what we're talking about. And you see, when you go along with a belief in life and matter that you have human parents and you and this and that and you are a human creator and, or whatever, and you go along with it in all these other ways and then your body starts screaming, well, then you can't say, okay, stop, body. No, your body's telling you to stop all that thinking. <laughs> You're telling not you what you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stay out of that Adam dream. That's what you do, and you do shout. You command it. I gave a testimony where I had this awful pain in my foot, and it, and it didn't stop. It was going on and on, and finally I just said, I, I use that treatment. I know what you are. You can't fool me. You're a belief of life and matter. I don't believe that to be true, and I am spiritual. Therefore, I am immune, and I kept at it, and then it stopped like a faucet turning off. Thank you. Welcome. 
now. And this is not human will. This is you exercising your God-given dominion over a false belief. Because it's the truth. And exactly. God has made man capable of this. Now, you see, this is why those pages, 390 to 393, that's what she's telling you. And she says, rise in the spirit, not rise in self-will. Rise in the spirit. The other thing that helps immeasurably is when you when you are working for God. And that doesn't mean you have to be a practitioner in this church. It means that whatever you do, you know you're doing it for God. And therefore, is God going to make you painful and, you know, not able to move or get out of bed? No. No. All you need is trying to speak. Thank you. You're welcome. And again, I think I find it very helpful. Uh, Again, that emphasis on God's allness. He tells us that's our weapon. It is. And that's the first commandment. You're believing a power apart from God. So, rise in the strength of spirit to resist all that is unlike good. God has made man capable of this, and nothing can vitiate the ability and power divinely bestowed upon man. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Nothing can vitiate it. Does everybody know what the word vitiate means? Yeah, like diminish. It's to render something powerless or useless. The power of God can never, ever be rendered useless or powerless. That is the science. And I keep going back to that this is all divine law, and it, it's the only outcome that can be. It is. It's the truth. You will prove it sooner or later, and I always say, why not sooner? Oh, and, and and but the consistency is important because if you go around during the day thinking you're born into matter and there are many ways to do that, then you know when you have a problem like this, it's a little harder to have mastery over it. But but you can be consistent, and you've got all of God working for you. He is the only power. He never said it. He never created it. Therefore, it's a belief. The only life, too. Right. I also like the scientific statement of being for that. I consider that my baseball bat. (laughs) Thank you. Absolutely. And and Mrs. Eddie has said that if a problem, you know, doesn't go right away, then um, you need a, a better sense of the nothingness of matter, and that's what scientific statement is. You're not in matter. But again, that's I am spiritual, therefore immune. And it's not material. He is spiritual. And only one cause and one effect, and that is all coming from God. Thank you. Yes. And both Bignell Young and, and Kimball have said the three things to handle in any case. You know what they are? No cause, no law, no substance. Yes, other than God. Law, cause, substance. So Thank you all, all very much. Cause. Of course, sure. Thank you for asking. So these are all, these are the ways to stay out of this Adam dream. And we don't want to go to the Adam dream because the Adam dream is, is the murderer. The liar from the beginning. All it can do is self-destruct, and so it's worth the effort, as Suzanne said on her post, to stay out of it and not to cherish your errors and remain in it and get farther and farther from the path of truth, life, and love. Now, Jeremy, what did you say in your walk, in your forming? <laughs> well, then I read in Luke seven forty four, and he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? This had the sense of this week that Christ Jesus was actually asking, Are you able to see that there's any part of a child of God here? Or do you see only a sinner to be ignored, reviled, or stoned? 
and it just got me thinking more about the eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and what that what that means in daily life. You know, in Christian science, I'm learning to expect only good to know that God is in personal truth, life, and love. That error is only powers to destroy itself. But more to mind says they expect both good and evil. It's been wonderful to learn that difference. Thank you so much. So, you know, you're irritated at somebody or you're offended by somebody. What's the espouse? Change, your, change yourself. The dominion is within. Think the best of the person. This doesn't mean to ignore it. There's a huge difference. But it means to pray and know that it is whoever it is, child of God, mind of Christ. Think of the good things they might have done. Anything good you can, emphasize that. Don't go chewing around on why you're so mad at them. You're only hurting yourself, and and you're polluting the atmosphere, and they might feel it. And if they do, it's only going to turn them off. They're going to say, phew, stay out of you. I'm not getting close to that person. (laughs) They feel it. So thank you, Jeremy. And then Linda. I just love the statement, thy faith has faith, they go in peace. But what I did was thought about what was the space because she had to be active in doing this. It wasn't just something that, like, the magic wand put over her. She had to overcome a lot to even just show up there, I think, and persist at it. Thank you. Thank you. And you see, this is where the humbleness comes in. And and Linda lived in every way, all faith, and it was her faith and her love that helped her. So, please, the humbleness, the faith, and the love, that will get you out of any hole, any time. But if you cherish your errors and go around with it and justify yourself, you will remain in the hole. But admitting that, yeah, I've made some mistakes and I'm going to just be as humble and loving as I possibly can will, will lift you up and out. I'm in the Pharisee, sure seemed to. <laughs> That's it. And the Christ was there. I thought it was amazing. He was there for both of them, but only one of them saw the Christ. Yes, that's right. So, what are you? What's the espousal? What are you seeing? And I guess Carol, you can read this. Is jo- what Joanne wrote. Man will find himself unfallen, upright, pure, and free. I've always loved this quote about man and have often used it to describe others and myself. And this morning, this treatment came to me. I am unfallen, never fell from God's love or out of grace, never fell in anyone's estimation, never took a fall. I am upright. I have a backbone that stands for truth, moral rectitude, never bending to an unprincipled demand. I am pure. My motives are pure and unselfish. My only desire is to serve God and practice Christian science to the best of my ability. I am free, free from guilt, from resentment, from false responsibility, from any burden evil can lay upon me. Thank you, lesson writers, for the lesson. Beautiful treatment. Treatment for a lot of things. Treatment for a backache. Treatment for a lot of things. She thought it through. I think it really speaks to one who is understanding that man is the manifestation or the result of God reflecting himself. It's beautiful. Yes. Yes, and, and, and really, isn't that a great way to start each day? To recognize yourself that way? Like uh, arming yourself. 
and she's specifically handling errors, you know, errors that would come to her, and she couldn't bend to an unprincipled demand. She could fall out of God's love, fall in anyone's estimation. All of these things she's specifically handling. So, and it, it's helpful to do that if you're having a problem. And, and I've told people, you know, well, write, write what's the problem, what's bothering you, and then write, what does God say about this? That's a treatment, okay? This is, this is how you give a treatment, how you do a watch. And knowing the truth purifies the error. And then pray to be receptive to it and to, to live it. Not just words, but live it. And now, last but not least, is Parthen on redeem. And I, I never knew this definition of redeem. What does he say about it? Those who read the forum. That was different definitions. It seemed like there were rules that they had made about who would do the redeeming and what the redeeming was for. For like, if you got yourself in debt, um, and or in servitude, I think servitude was one. Well, it was the idea that your redeemer is your closest kin kinsman. Redeemer kinsman. Who is our redeemer? God. God. Then who is our kinsman? God. God, and who does all these things that were listed? God. God. Again, this is getting us out of the human dream, and it's a perfect remedy for so-called Mother's Day. God is your redeemer. God is your closest kinsman. And the story of Ruth, because Boaz it was Ruth's closest kinsman, and when she was having a difficult time, what did he do? Hello? <laughs> Do you all know the story of Ruth? <laughs> yeah, he helped her, didn't he? he? He not only helped her, he was. He married her. He married her. He married her. Oh, well, yeah. after, after, he went, after he went to the trouble to make sure that he was the right one to marry her. And he watched over her, and, and yes, he did help her, watched over her, but then he married her. And then she had a child called Jesse. Who, you know, they believe is the line of, the line of, yes, the, David. Father yes, of David. Yes, it's a beautiful story, and and Ruth and all of them had been mourning. There, there, everybody had died, and it was a terrible situation in those days. So remember this, because if you know that God is your closest kin. Something wonderful happens, and he will care for you, but you've got to look in that direction and get over the pity party, which Ruth did. Ruth, Ruth was not going to have a pity party. And, and then I wrote on a 151 of miscellaneous writings, God is our father and our mother, our minister, and the great physician. He is man's only real relative on earth and in heaven. David sang, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> he is our only relative. If you get into thinking all of this other stuff, and it, believe me, it is probably the most easy thing to do, you'll end up suffering one way or another because it's not scientific. When you know God is your only relative, then you'll have all the relatives, all the kinsmen, all the friends, all the help, all the everything that you could ever need. And it might not wear the face of your human family. It'll wear the face of something else, somebody else. And then 266 in Science and Health. Would existence without personal friends be to you a blank? Then the time will come when you will be solitary, left without sympathy, but this seeming vacuum is already filled with divine love. 
when this hour of development comes, even if you cling to a sense of personal joys, spiritual love will force you to accept what best promotes your growth. Friends will betray and enemies will slander until the lesson is sufficient to exalt you. For man's extremity is God's opportunity. The author has experienced the foregoing prophecy and its blessings. Thus, he teaches mortals to lay down their fleshliness and gain spirituality. This is done through self-abnegation. Universal love is the divine way in Christian science. I used to hate that paragraph. (laughs) (laughs) But it is true. And and today that word, the last sentence popped off. I used to wonder, why did she put universal love as the divine way in Christian science? Why did she put that in this paragraph? Because you need to love everybody, not just your personal friends. Thank you so much. Right answer. Yes. You need to love everybody, not just your personal friends and family. And that was in the watch last night. That was a beautiful part of the watch last night. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to bring that up, too, because that brought out the Redeemer at the end. Oh, may your eyes not be holden, but you may discern spiritually What is our Redeemer? May you discern spiritually who is your closest kinsman. May you discern that. And when you do discern it, then you have this love for everyone. She uses the word personal twice in this paragraph. That's what you have to give up. You never have to give up anything good. You have to give up your personal sense of it. The fact that you own it and you control it and it's yours and you can't live without it. Personal, personal, personal. She says, would life without personal friends be to you a blank? And then when you cling to a sense of personal joys, only that person can make me happy. Well, thanks a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I know there have been times I've I've befriended people, you know, that I, I've, I've just felt inspired to do it. But if they're so having crying over their pity party about what they've lost or what they want, they don't even notice what God is doing in their life. I mean, you know, think about it. Even the, this, even maybe especially our website, all of this given free, this is God's hand blessing you. Are you sufficiently grateful for it? Uh, could I make a, a tiny correction? Yes. Okay. It's just um, the, the son of um, Ruth and Boaz was Obed, and then oh, his okay. was Jesse. Thank you, Obed. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. I would not want to be missed. Thank, Thank you. He was a great grandfather, not a grandfather. Thank you. <laughs> yes, but it was it was a wonderful. Wonderful rejoicing, and everything turned around. And Naomi was so happy after being so, so disheartened, so desolate, as the golden text says, desolate. But the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that, that trust in him shall be desolate. And what's the key condition there? Trust in him. Trust in him. Yeah. Trust. You've got to. Yes. That... That is our responsibility, and it's our only responsibility. And uh, Ruth fell in love with Naomi's God, and that's why she stuck with her. And then there's the beautiful story on the carousel of uh, Clara Shannon and Mrs. Eddie's love for somebody who was abusing her. Yes, yes, and that was sent to us by... um, Anne in England, because she had, she has wanted to contribute, and, and she said we didn't have anything on there by Clara Shannon, and that's a beautiful story, and that's also in the DVD that was she was talking about Woodbury, and, and that is acted out in the DVD, the DVDs by Longyear, the beautiful story, yes, 
and you see Mrs. Eddy's love universal. She loved even the grass, the blade of grass she walked on. Did she start out that way? No, she didn't. She didn't. If you read her early letters about her family, and she was crazy about her own family, her own mother, her favorite brother, but everything got yanked from her. That's why she said, I experienced these things and the, for- and the blessings where you lay aside this fleshly sense of life, the Adam dream. Even her own son was taken from her. Everything and everybody. There's one other thing I was just going to mention. I don't have time to get into it, but it's Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren, you who did not bear, break forth into singing, cry aloud. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapter in Isaiah. And it says, your maker is your husband. And it's been said, you know, if you're feeling desolate or feeling without kin, to read that once a week or to imbibe that and get to know that your kin is in God. It's a great comfort and a great help. And I know, believe me, I'm not saying any of this lightly, I know how hard it is sometimes to be alone, to be without somebody you love. But it doesn't help just linger in it. It helps to get to know your father better, to follow the ways of Christ. So we'll, we're going to end here uh, in miscellany. This is from miscellany, page 132, Mrs. Eddy's address at the annual meeting of 1899. Oh, may this hour be prolific, and at this time and in every heart May there come this benediction. Thou hast no longer to appeal to human strength, to strive with agony. I am thy deliverer. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Divine love has strengthened the hand and encouraged the heart of every member of this large church. Oh, may these rich blessings continue and be increased. Divine love hath opened the gate beautiful to us, where we may see God and live, see good in good, God all, one, one mind and that divine, where we may love our neighbor as ourselves and bless our enemies. Divine love will also rebuke and destroy disease and destroy the belief of life in matter. It will waken the dreamer, the sinner dreaming of pleasure in sin, the sick dreaming of suffering matter, the slothful satisfied to sleep and dream. Divine love is our only position and never loses a case. It binds up the brokenhearted, heals the poor body whose whole head is sick, and whose whole heart is faint. Comforts such as mourn, wipes away the unavailing, tired tear, brings back the wanderer to the Father's house, in which are many mansions, many welcomes, many pardons for the penitent. Oft times I think of this in the great light of the present, the might and light of the present fulfillment, So shall all earth's children at last come to acknowledge God and be one, inhabit his holy hill, the God-crowned summit of divine science. The church militant rise to the church triumphant, and Zion be glorified. Much love to you all, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.